thank you for coming out. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be recording this session so we can play it back. People can watch it in case they didn't get here. Feel free to ask questions as we go through this. Um, you know, feel free to you know, just raise it up. I'll probably repeat the questions just to make sure I get it on my audio here. Um, so good evening. My name is Stephen Heverin. Uh, I'm a member of the EAC. We also have Peter Wilson here, who's one of our commissioners uh, in the township. And so tonight I'm going to be giving a talk on practical sustainability. Uh, we often talk a lot of times about climate change, about the impact, uh, the impact of using so many plastics and fossil fuels and things like that. Um, and in a lot of the areas and circles, what I noticed we don't really give people is, okay, if I want to make a change, if I want to be able to do something right to help and do my little part, what can I do? Where do I start? There's lots of information out there. So that's what this talk is about. I call it a choose your own adventure of sustainability. Uh, and um, the, the why of this, I think, as we can tell tonight, uh, it's climate change. I'm not going to get into heavy details about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's there. It's happening. So these are things that we can do and leverage every day to make changes in um, what we're doing. Uh, as I said, I'm a member of the Springfield Township EAC. We've got the QR code here. We meet the fourth Wednesday of every month right here in the library. Come and join us. We're always looking for people to come out. We've got a lot of uh, projects that uh, have happened and have been going on this year. We have really a, a busy year. Uh, some of it you may have seen and heard about. Uh, we just recently had the native plant sale, which was a huge success. It's our second one. Uh, we sold out in 38 minutes. Um, so we're going to even up the total of plants a bit more than that. Um, work, uh, we've also been doing, we did a pilot for the NOMO May, uh, where we had about 25 participants in the township under, uh, with the approval of the commissioners under, cons under a conservancy plan, uh, where we could, didn't have to mow for the month of May. Uh, I was one of those participants. And so we're kind of growing that idea of looking at alternative alternatives to suburban landscapes, as well as cutting down on noise and air pollution and stuff like that. So we'll probably be going forward and doing more of that next year. Uh, Renewable Springfield is a, a program we've been working on with the township where we get to 100% clean renewable energy uh, for the municipal campus by uh, 2035 and electricity. for electricity and a clean uh, municipal fleet, 100% clean energy, municipal fleet, cars, vehicles, transportation, uh, you know, parks and rec equipment, that kind of stuff, by 2050. Um, so far, we've been doing really, really well. This is one of the buildings. We've done some energy audits and, and some things and really have improved that sustainability. Half of our police fleet, seven of 14 vehicles, are hybrid cars, uh, and they love them as well as saving a lot of fuel and offsetting a lot of carbon emissions. Uh, and, and lots of other projects and talks and things like this one throughout the year. Uh, as I said, this is, I am a resident of the township since 2002. Uh, married with my wife and daughter. My daughter is a bit older than that picture right now. We love to travel. Uh, I work as a technologist. I grew up in the region. I've been on the EAC now for 11 years. Uh, and obviously I have a big uh, uh, love of the environment and sustainability and, and practices. As I said, to choose your own adventure. So uh, some of the things we want to get into first are labels. Um, so the way this is going to run is I'll have go through a talk of some high things like labels and some other topics, and then we're going to get into some specific recommendations. You'll have the, some very specific things that you can walk out of here tonight to be able to make changes in different areas if you choose to. And as I said, as you go through and have questions, um, ask as we go along. So there's, um, I want to start off with the positive labels. There's lots and lots of labels. There's lots and lots of things out there that say you do this, you do that, different things like that. Hey, Chris. And um, the, the keys you want to look for when you're looking at labeling or understanding what a label is or what it means when you're looking at products to make choices to make them more sustainable or if they're more sustainable or environmentally friendly is, is it reducing or eliminating the use of chemicals? Is it reducing or eliminating the use of plastics, fossil fuels? 
Is it reusable or compostable? Uh, and then the, the two, last two are the most important. Is it a testable standard? Does that label represent something that is testable? standard that can demonstrate that that product is actually doing what that label says it does, right? Uh, there's lots of labels out there. There's lots of things that look like labels out there that mean absolutely nothing. Um, so, and, and the key with some of it is not only is it a testable standard, is that standard something where they're self-reporting it, meaning that they're on the honor system to say they're adhering to this, or is it verifiable that a third party goes out and tests and makes sure that, um, they're adhering to, to what they're saying or they're committing to what they're saying they are. There's labels for different standards, purposes, things like that. What I'm focusing on here is being able to reduce the use of plastics, being able to have materials that are more compostable and the reduction of fossil fuels. Um, there's other standards that do, that are testable and certified and things like that. And I'll touch on them in, in the next slide, but the focus here is really on that sustainability and kind of the waste and things that we generate. Um, so the labels that we have up here, there's a few. There's two of them right there, BPI, the Home OK, and um, they're in two different formats. They are two different colors. If you see that logo anywhere, that BPI logo on its own, or this uh, OK to compost, or the, the smaller BPI compostable label, that's what that means is that's an industry standard it's tested, it's been tested and proven to show that it's going to decompose into organic material within 180 days in a in a, an industrial managed compost, um, which is in terms of bags and things like that, that's what you wanna look for. That's the type of thing that you wanna uh, uh, see on there. Anything else that says it's biodegradable, biodegradable, it's, it's that it's just compostable if it doesn't have this logo, it doesn't, it's meaningless, it, it's, that's not the case. Um, Bioengineered, bio, it, it's, it's not something, it's like all natural. It's not actually a standard, it doesn't mean anything. It's a marketing term. Some of the, a couple of the others that are here, uh, one is Safer Choice. Um, it's an EPA standard and they run across, there's a whole host, there's a link. Um, when I put the presentation up on the website, there's a whole inventory you can go and look for products by the EPA, it goes across home goods, commercial goods, all kinds of products. And the idea there is to meet standards to reduce the use of harmful, harmful chemicals, PFAS, uh, fossil fuels, all of those types of stuff. And so products are, are certified within different categories to meet that standard. So if you see that labeled, you know it's a good standard. And you know you can go and check that by going onto the EPA website and seeing if that product is there and listed and actually get a lot more information about that product as well. Um, USDA certified bio-based product. Um, this one comes with an asterisk. <laughs> it's, it's a standard, it's testable. Um, it, and, and the key is in the two, in the sample image I have there, you say a product and package and it's got a percentage next to it. Um, the goal with that, that program is to leverage less fossil fuels in the manufacture of the product or the product packaging. So you'll see a percentage for that. So there could be things that are USDA certified bio-based, but not a high percentage. Um, so it's, it's one that can kind of come with a caveat. It's there, it's a tested, and, it, and the goal is to reduce that reliance uh, on those, those things like fossil fuels and plastics and, and harmful chemicals and to, to reduce or eliminate them. So there's some really great products that are certified for this that really meet a high standard and a high bar. Uh, the last one there is the Climate Pledge Friendly. That's um, with Amazon, that's our Amazon standard. The focus there, and, and it's one of the things I'll get to, their focus is not so much on the contents of the products, but on the packagings. Uh, on the packaging, not just in terms of how they're shipping the stuff, but working with suppliers and things like that to reduce the amount of uh, plastic and uh, things or to even re-architect and re-engineer some products so that they use even less paper and, and materials like that to kind of, the goal is there to reduce those materials that we're really just using once and throwing away. Oops, too far. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, here's some other things to avoid. Uh, as I was looking through some of these products, 
Uh, I really like the second one. It exceeds the EPA procurement guidelines by 700%. That means absolutely nothing. It means that somebody can buy that in the EPA under government purchasing guidelines. That's all that means. But they touted it as a, as a key thing. Is, uh, I think it was on a set of trash bags. Um, things like made from 70% certified post-consumer uh, plastics and stuff like that. Anything that's, quote, recycling plastics, it's, it's, it's not. It's hard to do. It's, you're, not, you're not removing the problem because you're still using plastics. You're still using those fossil fuels, and we want to be able to move away from some of that. Uh, other things like non-GMO verified or USD certified organic, they are absolutely third-party tested, third-party verified programs. If you want to have food and food products that are more organic in nature in terms of how they are, that's great. They have no relation in terms of the sustainability of the packaging, of, of using less fossil fuels necessarily. I think by the nature of some of these programs, they do, but it's, it's not something that's really spe specifically targeted at sustainability. Uh, one of the others, like All Natural, as I mentioned, any, band, any brand that has green bags or green logos or green something, uh, take with a grain of salt and look a little bit further. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of greenwashing in a lot of cases, especially with bags that claim to be compostable and things like that. You'll often see them as green bags. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. I could. Right. Biodegradable is not a standard term. It's, it's a market, like all natural, it's a marketing term. It says it can break down. Well, everything can break down. It doesn't mean that it's not going to, it doesn't mean it can break down into organic materials. And a lot of times it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, it could, it'll eventually break down in say a thousand years. That could make that claim. Yes. Uh, so greenwashing is where you, where, where companies or brands will put stuff on, like I said, like if saying it's something's all natural or it's biodegradable, or we're doing so much for the environment or something like that, that they're making it seem like they're doing something or their product is better for you, better for the environment, and it's, it's not, right? It's some of those terms. Yes, ma'am. Say they're bi so biodegradable. Right. Machine one Right, and and so that's what you that same load for those bags, just like kitchen trash bags we get to those bags. If you look for that BPI compostable label or um, or that uh, home compostable label, then you'll know those bags are compostable. Right, they do, but they're still usually made of some form of plastic, some form of fossil fuel. Um, so you want to look for that label in those packages, and I know they exist. And they, they have them similar. Some of the companies that make these bags that we'll get to have that as well. So, no, great question. Yes, sir. Not too long ago, you mentioned or it, it said up in the upper right corner, um, your area may not have the appropriate compostable uh, or commercially compostable area. Back then. Top right. Oh, yeah, that just, right. Were, were, were that... so, so it is still worthwhile because if it's, if it's to this standard, what that means is it's going to break down into organic matter. So even if it goes into a landfill, which we don't necessarily want, even if it goes into a landfill, it will break down and break down into organic matter, whereas if you just take a regular bag that's not compostable to this standard, it's gonna, it could break down, but it's gonna break down into, um, you know, chemicals and, you know, different compounds that are not organic compounds to be able to compost. So, so it's okay that we don't have one of these in our area, at least not immediately. As you know, we have the Cavanta plant which does and incinerates all our trash, which is a whole set of other controversies I'm not gonna get into. 
Um, but the goal here is if it's that standard, that means it's going to break down into organic materials. Well, it is. It is because it's still going to break down. It's going to break down if you have a choice between buying a bag that's compostable or buying a bag that's still made from fossil fuels. You want to get this bag. You're still lessening your impact. Well, again, and again, not to, it, it does, because then you, you have to talk about when you're incinerating that, you're incinerating something that could break down to organic material or something that could break down to chemicals and off gas to harmful chemicals and things like that. Yeah, they're supposed to. It's not going to catch everything, Chris. It's not. It, uh, you're, you're slicing hairs on this, and it's, it's, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. So bringing it around to uh, kind of the waste stream a little bit, uh, and here's something that's what's in our area, in our region. So looking at a couple things on the one side, you've got, uh, they did a study of the Pennsylvania uh, municipal something waste. It forgets. Solid waste. Solid waste. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Solid waste. Uh, between at, in 2001 and then again in 2021. Uh, and they break it down into just large categories here in the volume in, in tons of material in Pennsylvania. Um, some, some good things here, uh, you see the, that inorganics and paper and stuff have gone down while organics have gone up, but also you see, can see here how significantly between 2001 and 2021, how much more significant where plastic, use of plastics is. And this is all stuff that goes into municipal solid waste across the state of Pennsylvania. In, uh, in our own, in the township here, just to give you an idea of some of the, 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 the numbers of what we collect here, last uh, comparing April, you can see the tonnage of res refuse and the tonnage of recycling. Uh, that we collect within the township. And also I have up there, I didn't put it in the fancy chart, um, for 2022, the leaf waste, uh, since 2020, we've been collecting the leaf waste year round. Uh, and so we uh, are up to collecting around uh, a thousand tons of leaf waste. That goes into compost that's managed by the township on the Morris Arboretum property. So that's a thousand tons of waste that is not going into our waste stream, uh, which is it's it, that's a lot. Of, it's a lot of compost, uh, and that compost, if you don't weren't aware, is available to the township uh, off of the road behind north, off the uh, road across from the mount. Yeah, northwestern. Uh, further, you to come pick up year round and use as you. Uh, see fit. They maintain uh, a great compost pile with that. Um, <clears throat> exactly. Right. Exactly. The, the, for everything that goes into the refuse, that's money that the township has to pay to take care of and haul that refuse away. So every ton that we save and avoid from that waste stream, it's saving us money. So starting into some of the recommendations. First things, rather than throw it out, you want to you want to take a look and and participate in the, the circular economy. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. There's even more ways to do it now. Um, and and the, the top couple uh, that are there, I mean, it basically, if you don't need it anymore, the, the phrase somebody's somebody's trash is somebody else's treasure uh, is very true. And uh, there's uh, on Facebook, there's buy nothing groups. There's some local ones here. My wife is a huge participant in those. Um, Nextdoor.com and or even just posting out a curb alert. If you've got something to get rid of, we just did that actually recently to get rid of some things we didn't need, but were per perfectly functional. Um, there's also thrifting, consignment shops, uh, donations, Cradles to Crown, Goodwill, other organizations that are willing to take those materials. And in a lot of cases, depending on how much you have, um, you can uh, give them a call and they'll come pick it up. Um, but really, I think one of my, my favorite stories from my wife from 
uh, everybody that trades and gives things away through like the buy nothing group. There was a, a woman who moved into the township and basically furnished her entire apartment for free from the things that she got from the buy nothing group. So it goes off and, and, and can have a, a good cause. So uh, a lot of things that you can do that way if you don't have it, you know, if you don't, you know, you can go and, and do these groups pretty trustworthy uh, to do that. The next one is reusable grocery bags. It's another source of plastics, specifically single use plastic bags. Uh, and the number is 100 billion plastic bags every year just in the U.S. Person on average person, every individual is 365 plastic bags, single use plastic bags per year. That's a lot. That's significant. That's, you know, um, large grocery trip can 15 to 20 grocery bags, right? Um, reusable bags. I have a couple here as a selection. I got this little one that unfolds. I keep it fits in my pocket. I have a couple like this, uh, bigger ones that you can reuse and even bigger ones that these will fold out to, to, to bag size. Um, my wife and I, we keep lots of them in our car. It's the best place to keep them because it's always where you forget, oh, I forgot to bring my bags with me. You know, not, if they're in a car, you know you can grab them and take them with you. Um, it's, if you do that consistently throughout the year, that means you're, you and you, you know, your spouse and family, however many people live in your house, that's how many bags you can save a year by just bringing your own bags. And in a lot of cases, like if you do the Giant or Sam's Club, you got the little gun or the app on your phone, you can go in and then have the bags in your cart and you can fill your cart as you go along and just scan and you check out and it makes it super, super easy. Um, I almost won't shop at some place that doesn't do that. <laughs> uh, one of the other things you can do, and we'll talk towards the end about this, is talk to your local retailers, talk to the managers, ask them, can they stop using single-use plastic bags? Can they, you know, still having paper bags available? You know, sometimes you forget things like that. Um, but to ask them to see if they can stop doing that. There's more around that, but um, I like to throw that in there. Overall, high-level home efficiency. The key here is to electrify everything. Um, you, you don't, and you don't need to have solar panels on your roof. You don't need to go off the grid or anything fancy like that. You don't, you know. Basic home repair and maintenance, it's still one of the greatest ways of saving energy, help reducing the amount of emissions that you have, making sure you're insulated, making sure your windows and doors and everything are current. It really makes an impact. When I first went to go do solar on my home, the first thing I did was look at the home itself, how much energy I was using, and I fixed all of those things. I put insulation in the walls because in the 1950s house I moved into, they thought the thin sheet of aluminum foil in the wall was insulation. Um, I replaced the windows. I replaced the furnace, which was original to the house, which it kicked out great heat, just not very efficiently uh, for being something that was like 40 years old, 50 years old. Um, replace larger appliances and, and HV equipment when they're end of life or as they come due, and there's a, a little more I'll have on that. Um, PA has a whole home repair program based on how much income you make. Uh, you can qualify to get some assistance on making some of these home repairs. Uh, they were doing this in Philly, my understanding from, I think, from one of our senators or someone, it was fairly successful, and they're looking at refunding it to keep it going um, because some people who might be on fixed incomes and things like that might not be able to afford some of these repairs, and I think that's, that's a gap. That's something I've heard before from others that you just can't, you know, you want to make this change, but it can be cost prohibitive when you're on a fixed income. So how do I know when I need to replace something? Uh, I got a QR code for this, and the link will be up on this on the uh, on the with the presentation to the website. Consumer Reports makes a handy little tool uh, that, as you see, a screenshot here is you know based on how old the appliance is, how much it might cost to repair it. Um, and how much it cost it originally. You can change all those variables and pick your different type of appliance there. They've got all of the, all of the common ones that we use up there. And that'll give you an idea of whether or not you should repair it, consider repairing it, or maybe just replace it. 
Um, and and it's it's a handy guide because sometimes with some of these things you don't know, you're not sure is it is it in the life, and you don't necessarily want to get into all the math of trying to figure out how much more efficient when would I save stuff. Try this first if you've got some of those major appliances that are coming due. Right, with some of the, the federal programs and stuff, you'll get tax credits and rebates and things like that. So you want to keep an eye on that. So maybe it's hang on to it for a little bit longer until you know you can get into one of those programs. So what should the relation, re replacement be? At a high level, um, as I said, electrify everything. So uh, if you're using gas or oil-based HVAC equipment, go with electric heat pumps or electric uh, mini split systems. They're super, super efficient. They're way more efficient than, than either of those systems are. It depends if it's probably your calculator tells you that. Right. Yeah. But more for it at the store. So when the furnace guy says it'll cost you $2,000 more to get an electric heat pump, that's what the rebate is. Right. And, and and it's another thing. So and that's a note I have down here. Uh, obviously, gas go to electric dryer, lights, LEDs, um, again, electrify everything. But again, some of the challenges and this is what I've run into when I was doing some home renovations or looking at some of these newer technologies is uh, those that are in the trades. Not everyone is up onto some of these newer technologies like with heat pumps. Um, or with electric induction stoves and things like that. So that can be another barrier or challenge to go around um, to someone and find someone who is knowledgeable about moving to that. So you may, if they don't know about it, they may oftentimes, I've run into this myself, where they say, oh, no, that's not worth it. It's not really good or anything like that. That's not true. Um, so you may have to go around and, and search for some, some individuals to talk to that can give you some better guidance there. And I think when it comes to things like heat pumps, uh, we're planning, I think, something to be presented on heat pumps later in the year. Uh, see, we have to do, we have, I think, a couple of can do some more investigation with this. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think in, I've, I've read that as well. You, you might have heard when the, um, not the EPA, but others were looking at getting feedback and comments on gas stoves and stuff like that, because they do off gas into the house. It's not 100% uh, healthy for you, obviously, depending on how efficient or how good or safe that is. Um, so that is, as a concern, running gas, gas uh, uh, equipment, like I told you, the furnace that I took out of my house. You know, we thought there was certain stuff on the walls when we renovated the house from because we he was a smoker. Now it also turned out because the furnace was cracked. So that 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 was that was off gassing as well. So you have some of those considerations that with the electric systems you don't have, as well as having that that safety issue, as well as having that that more and better efficiency. And funny you should say that. I did experiment with induction. I am experimenting with induction. Um, so electric ranges. Um, the, there's, there's electric ranges and then there's induction ranges. So electric ranges might be what you're, you're used to seeing or what I grew up with is, is that metal coil that would glow red, get hot. You, you know, you put the pot on there, occasionally you'd accidentally burn yourself. Um, that's not what an induction burner is. An induction burner is basically a magnetic coil that conducts electricity and, and generates that heat directly in the pan itself, in the pan or the pot itself. Um, they're super efficient, really quick to heat. You can boil water in about half the time uh, as on a conventional stove. Um, and you see that's an example of just a standalone one at the top and then at the bottom, uh, you know, kind of that electric range, what they'll look like. This isn't for everyone. I like to cook. I love to cook. Um, 
I I have a gas stove in my house. I don't, and I but I also have an electric induction burner off to the side as well. Um, I got the stove before I went down this path and before some of these things. Um, it requires a change in 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 how you cook. If you're one of those people that likes to move the pan and shake the pan around, you can't do that on the induction. It has to maintain contact. And your pots and pans, not all of your pots and pans are going to work. They have to be uh, cast iron or ferrous metals in order to be able to conduct that electricity through there and to be able to, to, to conduct that. So that means, you know, if you're used to taking it off and flipping it around and they can't really do that uh, with this. So it's a change in behavior for some of those things that I'm not even quite there yet on. Um, but they are really, really, really efficient. They both love induction and yep. Bruce Conley went all induction. Yeah. And they are a little more expensive, but when you're looking at something again that you're keeping in your house for 15, 20 or more years, it it, it, it does pay for its spell. Yes. Do you run across the same thing that says they're more efficient than other alloys? Uh, yeah, as 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 long as it can conduct with the um, with that, it I haven't looked at anything deeper than that that it works. Basically, I haven't looked to see if if one type of metal pan or cast iron is more efficient than the other. I haven't really gone to that level. Just knowing and understanding what types of pans would work with an induction stove. Um, uh, another high-level item, judging a book by its cover packaging. Um, and, and I think from what I've put together with this and a lot of what these recommendations really revolve around has to do with packaging, whether it's the packaging of the container to hold the product itself or the packaging of the container that that product comes in. Um, you know, look for, you want to look for companies and products that basically are showing that they are not only taking care in the products that they're making, but also taking care in how those products are packaged. You know, we've all gotten those plastic blister packs and those things that are just near impossible short of a blowtorch to open up, um, or you get something in that's packaged and, and delivered and it's got all the cable ties and it's a box in a box in a box, and why you don't need that. Um, so you wanna kind of look for, look for stuff uh, when it comes to the food products, things like that, look for larger, larger sizes, bigger ratios. Like if there's more product and less packaging around it, right? You want to buy those bigger ratios, those those bigger sizes. Um, again, packaging that is compostable, that is paper that's not plastic. Um, and I'll get to some of that too, where there's some really cool things going on there. Uh, products that have, again, demonstrably made an effort to reduce their packaging over time. And there's a lot of companies that are doing, I think they're starting to recognize that and starting to do more of that. I mean, you still, have, especially, you still have a lot of plastics out there and a lot of single use and some of that's behavioral, uh, which is kind of what we're, we're talking about now. So let's dive into some specific recommendations. Um, just to note, since I am on the EAC uh, and a volunteer for the township, these are my own, when I'm talking about some of these products, my own specific recommendations. I'm talking about uh, uh, you know, if I've got direct experience with it, I'm going to talk about those products because I have direct experience with it. Other products, I'm going to say it's in a class and these are the types of brands that you would look for. I'm not making generally specific recommendations. I think that's enough of a disclaimer, right? Uh, trash bags, kitchen trash bags. And then this is what would fall into that category of the compostable questions for the doll bags that you talked about earlier. Uh, pretty simple. It's that. Look for that logo. All of these brands here, Ghost Bags, Biobag, Eco Ecosol, um, they make them in multiple sizes. So the kitchen size, 13-gallon bags, down to the smaller trash can bags, and then also if you want to look for the rolls of the, the, the doggy waste bags. Um, I, I use them. I've used some brands. The main one I'm using is Ghost Bags, is my kitchen and, and uh, cans. It comes with the drawstrings on it, something that everybody likes. It's durable, it holds up, uh, it's not leaking or 
spreading around, you know, breaking on you like some of those those old trash can commercials and then you pull it out and it breaks all over the floor. Um, it, they work. Um, I get mine on Amazon in bulk, um, but you can, you, I believe a couple of local stores do have these. I haven't checked if like Sam's Club or Costco has them, um, but you can look around, you can get them, you know, I get them in bulk, big, you know, a couple big boxes at a time. Um, definitely show, uh, stores like Wegmans, Whole Foods, those types of places, those types of stores would have them. I uh, haven't looked at Mom's Organic if they do or not, but they would, they would, those would probably lean to being uh, stores that would have it if you want something in person. If you don't see it at your retailer, ask them for it. Ask them to stock it. Ask them to bring these products in. Um, laundry. Um, what to look for, and, and the, the format here for a lot of these recommendations is what to look for and then examples. Pretty pretty straightforward and basic. So for the laundry, what you wanna look for are fewer chemicals, fa fragrance free, um, again, concentrates. So there's more loads within a package. So you're using less package for more loads. Uh, plastic free packaging, safe for sensitive skin. That kind of goes back to the fragrance free and the, and the uh, fewer chemicals. Um, bio or organic based uh, in terms of the product itself. Some of those examples are seventh generation. Even the Tide Pure Clean meets, meets those. So if you want a particular brand, some of the brands like Tide and others are starting to manufacture products that have and meet all of these, these things, which is great to see. They're one of the ones that they have the big dispenser package that has like the spout on it. Um, they've redesigned that to even be uh, non-plastic packaging. Um, Tide, seventh generation drops, Ecos, all of these offer them in whatever format you might be doing your laundry in, whether it's a powder, a liquid, pods. Uh, I think it's Ecos or drops with the pods. Not only is the packaging, just paper packaging, the pods the, themselves, um, are, will break down and are not plastic, which I think is the, the fact that somebody figured that out is pretty cool. Um, and sheets like for dryer sheets and stuff like that, you can have uh, dryer sheets that, um, don't have, have all those things in there are more paper-based. Pretty simple, right? Household cleaning. Um, this, this is also something that is, is still a little newer area for me. Uh, Sponges and cleaning wipes, which are plastic free. All those sponges, all of those wipes, things like that have some form of plastics or you know, chemical use. That, that's how they were manufactured. Um, no dyes, sulfates, petrochemicals, uh, SLS. I'll mention what that is on the next slide. Uh, and in terms of the, the wipes and rags, look for stuff that's cotton based. But you can get non-plastic based sponges uh, from companies like this. There's Pure C Zero Waste Club. Bon Ami cleaning powder has been around for like a hundred years um, and it falls into this category. Uh, there's another one called um, Bartenders or Barkeeper's Friend. Um, it also has been around for ages. It's, it's, it doesn't have all those chemicals, all those things in it and it works. All of these products in terms of cleaning your home, cleaning your windows, cleaning your countertops, they all work. You don't need it with all of those additives, all those additional chemicals uh, in them. So again, there's a lot of these. I think some of these uh, would be harder to find, I uh, said so maybe the Bon Ami one, um, in stores itself. So something you want to order online. Uh, and a lot of these cleaning, like I'm getting it now, it looks like a milk carton. It looks like a the narrow skinny liter milk cartons and stuff. That's how you get it. Instead of the big plastic bottles, um, that's, that's some of the changes and stuff that they're making. Uh, same thing uh, for kitchen soaps. Again, liquid or solid soaps, depending on what you're using. Look for things that are chlorine and phosphate free. Uh, again, look at the packaging available in concentrates. Dye on SLS free, and this is where I define it on the second slide, not the first one for some reason. Um, it's a surfactant. It's what makes the bubbles. You don't really need the bubbles. And it's got that longer name, which I know if I say I will mess up. 
Um, some examples, Puracy, Clean Coat, Clean Coat is the, is the kitchen hand and um, uh, kitchen soap that I'm using, liquid soaps that I'm using. I really like it. Dr. Bronner's, um, who plastic bottles still, but you can get them in bulk, in volume. Uh, another brand is ET. Uh, Clean Colton and Dr. Bronner's is something that I'm familiar with, both of those. I am gonna make, uh, uh, say one word about, yeah, I really like coffee. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it, you have the K-Cups, the single-use coffee machines, Keurig's one of them, uh, is the one. Um, the pods and everything that they come in are plastic. Uh, and you cannot easily disengage the plastic from the coffee grounds that are inside of them. Um, I also don't think the coffee's great, but. Um, uh, another brand is Nespresso, a little fancier, fancier brand. Uh, the difference between these two is that the pods for Nespresso are aluminum. And um, they are completely recyclable again and again and again. It's aluminum. You can keep reusing that, keep recycling that. You can't do that with the, the, the Keurigs and, the, and those plastic cups. Um, even if you separate out, which I, there's a tool you can use to kind of cut the pods apart, separate the ground. It's a mess. It's hard to do. It doesn't always work. Um, the other plus for Nespresso, besides, in my mind, being better coffee, with those pods, Nespresso will, they have a program. It's what we participate in. They send you when you, they send you pods, they send you a bag. You fill up that bag with your used pods and they take them back at no cost to you. So they're basically showing something that uh, is, is, is something you may have heard of, producer responsibility. Uh, and that's something that you may hear people talk about more and more is having different companies be responsible for the products, the end of life of the products that they make uh, to have to take them back. So the fact that they have that program, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, you're gonna get recycled and reused for the aluminum. Grounds can be composted, things like that. Uh, even within that, you can get a bit more efficient. If you do have the Keurigs, they have reusable pods like this that you can fill with your own coffee, snap the lid in and pop it into the machine. Uh, and the Nespresso's have a similar thing at the top there, capsules that you can fill with your own coffee. So that way you're reusing that capsule again and again. And when I'm done with that, I just take it and I dump the grounds in my compost bin that I take outside. Um, and then clean out and reuse the pot itself. So again, all these levels that you can do this in. Um, personal care, deodorants, toothbrush, shaving. Um, this to me is kind of, there's, there's a couple things here. One, uh, fragrance-free and aluminum-free. Um, you know, there's some things and concern that people have about, you know, cancer risk and things like that. Not a proven link, um, but something, you know, again, where if you can leave some of these things out of the products that you're using on yourself and on your body and still have the same effect, like with deodorants and stuff, it, you, you wanna take a look at this. The other area that I think with these that gets really, really cool and, and all of these have that product now is you can get like a deodorant stick that's completely paper-based packaging. It's not a plastic, because if you look at that, use that deodorant stick, whatever, when you're done with it, you have that thing of plastic there that you now throw in the trash, right? Sometimes you can recycle them, not always. Um, they're now making them, and you'll see more products like this that are paper-based so that you can go and you can feel more comfortable because it's gonna break down, right? Because that you've used that for its life and then it just goes out um, and it holds up. There's a lot of those things like your, people would have concerns like, oh, is it gonna, after am I using it for a month, is it gonna break down? Is it gonna leak all over the place? Is it nope. These, these really, really do hold up. A couple of brands, like I said, Native, Schmitch, Schmitch, Smits, uh, Toms of Maine, uh, all good products. Some of the other areas too that you can start to look at, toothbrushes is a big thing. You're supposed to change your toothbrush every three months, six months, something like that. It, um, I'm sure we all do it on a great schedule like our dentist recommends, um, but it's a plastic toothbrush with plastic bristles, right? So that's more, plastic there that you're only using for a couple months and then throwing out. 
um, or as my wife likes, she takes to reuse them and use them as cleaning brushes until there really is nothing left of them, right? Um, but in the end of the day, it's still that plastic that you're throwing out into the trash. So there's, you're starting to see more products like this. And, and for me, it's when you see companies and things doing this, if you have that opportunity to get that product and support them, get that product, right, over what you might normally reach for. Take that moment to think about that. Because you can get brushes that are, are made from, you know, uh, sustainably forest, forested wood, and the bristles and stuff don't have to be made of plastic. And they still do the same job, still last the same amount of time. Uh, as as you do with this. Um, and so a lot of these areas too, you wanna look for some of those things uh, that are free from some of those chemicals and ideally are starting to use plastic pack, uh, paper, not plastic, paper-based packaging, not plastic-based or plastic-free packaging. And all of the other areas that we talked, that I talked about tonight um, have that same thing. Seventh generation for laundry detergent, things like that. You can get the containers, the things in paper-based packaging and not plastic-based packaging. Finally, coming around to the last few things, outside the home landscaping. Um, talking about, uh, I mentioned at the top, the no mow May that we did. It's where you don't mow your lawn for the month of May. That helps pollinators and insects and things in spring that are starting to come out of the ground and awaken from their sleeps um, to kind of have that time. It also lets your grass grow deeper roots, become more drought tolerant, um, as well as helping other insects like lacewigs and lightning bugs. Uh, and it also, for that month, reduces the amount of noise and air pollution that you get. Um, so uh, it uh, by doing some changes outside the home, you can kind of reduce, and, and it's a kind of multi-hit thing. Not only are you reducing air pollution, noise pollution, uh, if you're not using the chemical fertilizers on your lawn, reducing that kind of chemical runoff that would go into the stormwater. If you take some basic landscaping, uh, you can make a lot of impact to bring better stormwater on your property, not having it go rushing down the street and flowing into the stormwater systems or overflowing and flooding things. Um, composting. Uh, composting takes probably about 25%, depending on what you eat, um, out of the waste stream. So if you compost, and those are my two, those are my two compost bins back there. They're a little overflowing. Um, but again, I just I just have them back there. I don't get fancy with it. I don't people people get fancy and turn it every time. And do, I didn't do any of that back there. I take my compost bin from my kitchen scraps. I dump it out there. I throw in some lawn waste in there, and I just I ignore it. And it's fine. It doesn't stink. It it, it doesn't have a problem with anything like that. Um, and most recently, we built some new garden beds for my wife to extend, we added four more gardens, but I got like four and a half wheelbarrow fulls, heaping wheelbarrow fulls of compost from this. And I did nothing to get it other than dump my stuff there. Yes. I We did, we had them out there for that. Yep, we had that out there with a little QR code, yep. So I think we're gonna look to maybe increase that amount of people wanting to participate and do that uh, through the month. Uh, and more information there. Obviously, plant native use, avoid uh, use of fertilizers. Also, rain barrels where you can put them on your downspouts. And that's that's more for stormwater. That's less plastics and chemicals and things like that. But I'd like to throw that in there as well. Uh, but I will get back to the electrify everything. Um, use an electric mower, electric weed whacker. They're great. Uh, to uh, electric mower again. I had one a number of years ago. A number of years ago, they weren't quite there yet, battery-wise. And in terms of being able to, to, to handle a suburban lawn on a charge, these things absolutely do it. I took this out at the end of No Mow May with my grass up that was high, and it had zero issues mowing my lawn. It went right through it. These, uh, I have the Ego mower. That's what's, what's pictured here, and I know a number of other people in the township have the ego mower as well. Um, and I really like it. Uh, again, you're not dealing with it. They're, they're quiet. They're not kicking out the, the air pollution. And again, if, if you use a lawn service, those guys are sitting there running on gas mowers, gas blowers, and things like that all day long, breathing in all of that, that pollution as well as creating all of that noise. 
Um, yes, yes, because there's also, so that brings to, uh, if you use a lawn service, no, no, no problem with that. Start talking to your landscapers, to your lawn service, asking them when they're looking to switch. We've got a, uh, the township parks and rec group is looking at electrifying their, um, their public works, excuse me, is looking to electrify their mowing equipment, uh, landscaping equipment. Uh, and so I think there's a Toro is coming out to do a demo for them for their commercial grade electric mowers and things like that, riding mowers and stuff like that. So we're at that point now, this works. This is, this is absolutely practical for you to do if you just wanna mow your own lawn or for, for other people like landscapers and, and commercial grade equipment to start looking at that. So maybe if you're using that lawn service, ask them about it or ask them to, to consider it. I think this is, might be the next last one, take away, take out. Um, when you're ordering, I mean, a lot of times when I'm ordering for takeout, I'm going back home, right? Sometimes I'm not, sometimes I'm going elsewhere. That's why I ordered takeout. Make sure you let them know if they don't ask, know you, that you don't need utensils. Why well, I got them back at my house. I don't need the napkins. I don't need the condiment packets uh, or all that extra stuff that they might throw in there. Um, at just kind of take that on them. Some places will ask you now, or if they're not, maybe recommend, hey, you might wanna make this change. If you're dining in, um, some other things, you know, ask them to make sure they do things like straws upon request, right? You go to the someplace, a diner or someplace, and they, they, you come down, they bring you the water, and they just throw like a handful of plastic straws down on the table and stuff like that, which half the time you're not, you're not using and stuff. Ask them for the takeout to, to um, if they can switch to more reusable packaging. You know, not putting it in a paper bag and then putting it in a single use plastic bag as well. Those types of things. Make that mention of that or say that you don't need it um, when you're coming to pick up your, your takeout and stuff like that. Or the foam takeout containers, the styrofoam containers. Yes. 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 Uh, and finally, this is this is really it. It's make your voice heard. We as members of the EAC, we talk to the our board of commissioners we talk to the you know town you know we try to educate everybody here we speak to our elected officials and raise it up but it would really help if you also raise it up it can be as simple as an email to your county state or national legislator you know whatever level all levels actually let them know that you want to see some of these things you want to see things like putting in place single-use plastic bag bans uh, you know, having requirements um, to make changes for industry to make changes in terms of the packaging and the amount of fossil fuels that they use. You want to raise that up and make sure that your voice is being heard and that they're they're hearing it. Businesses, again, if you're if you go to that business frequently, you know those individuals. Mention it to them. Have those conversations with them. Ask them, hey, can you maybe consider doing this or have you considered this? Some cases they have it, right? They may not be aware. They're busy running their business. They may not know about making this change. Uh, that could could save them some money as well. And that's it. That's what I've got. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, or anything that you put. Yes, what do you have? Program Springfield was just that for that. So it, we had introduced it. It had not passed. The Board of Commissioners did not, um, were not uh, vote for it. Yes, we did. Yes, we did a questionnaire. We did a survey. Uh, we've done a number of educational events. Um, we've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with different commissioners and, and uh, the township about it. We've engaged the businesses and had conversations with them, the Rotary. Um, so we've been, as an EAC, kind of moving along, continuing. This is something we'd like to see still. Um, and uh, we're at the point that uh, likely in July, we're going to reintroduce and re-ask some with some additional materials to the Board of Commissioners to have them consider it again. Um, so if it's something you want, definitely reach out to your commissioner or commissioners and let them know that you would, that you would like to see it, right? Let them know that you would like to see it. 
Uh, we've been doing a lot of educations and we've, we've put together, specifically I've done a lot of work to put together a program to go alongside a single use plastic bag ban. There were some, some questions about uh, and some pushback related to kind of doing some more education with the businesses as well as with the residents as, and also kind of having something in place, a program that's gonna more clearly outline, well, what is this impact look like? to the community, to individuals, and how would this be implemented? So some of the commissioners had some questions around that, asking for that. So we went back, sharpened our pencils, and uh, have, have put together something, I think, that's um, with a little more uh, behind what the, some of the commissioners were looking for. And also had some time for them to see and talk and, and contemplate that, and also hear more from, from their constituents. And to see how some of the programs that have been passed in in other right. jurisdictions are working. Yeah. You know, what's what's working and what's not. Right. The the impact Philadelphia is a great example. They've been extremely successful. There's a lot of other townships around us that have also now recently passed this, and there's been some others a little more further afield that have had their programs in place for a while, uh, and see a very positive impact from yeah. this. Um, I, I think there was some some pushback and concern uh, in terms of whether or not that this is something they should do at this level. I think there's in our, a lot of the art, there's in that card in regard, it's generally an argument of this is something that should be done at the state level. I absolutely don't disagree. It should be done at the state level. I'd love to see it done at the state level, but I think we all understand that the climate that we are in in Pennsylvania at that state level, that is not something that is in the near term future. Um, you know, there's still a lot of pushback with the RGGI that we've joined, the regional um, greenhouse gas initiative um, program that's been in place in other states for more than a decade and has multiple positive impacts. Uh, so, so there's some challenges there with that. Um, and I think here also at this level, it's Again, some of it was the education, some of it was understanding how would this be implemented, how should we implement it, and then some of it was a wait and see that we want to see how some of these other municipalities that are like us around us, how they fare with some of this. No, there is no, I don't, I don't believe there's any sing, secret uh, 